Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the MLA Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar series. My name's David Brown and I'll be your webinar host tonight. Next week we have a webinar that will be focusing on certain drugs that are available to increase the fertility of ewes, especially those out of season. Um, it'll be a natural follow-on to our previous webinar on teasers, um, but this time looking at um, some drugs that are available to um, to increase uh, the uh, estrus and ovulation of, of ewes at joining time. Uh, so tonight's webinar is all about increasing wool income from prime lamb flocks. Now it's a special night because we have a dual delivery uh, by both Andrew Woods uh, he, of Independent Commodity Services and also by myself, David Brown of Home Sackett. Uh, we both have uh, small parts we can contribute to the webinar and um, we'll be able to break it up and deliver to them, to deliver them to you over the next half hour. Most of you are aware of the webinar platform, but don't forget you can clap this control panel. You can hear us, but uh, we can't hear you. Now, don't forget to drop your questions in the questions box there, and you're welcome to let us know what the weather's doing in your part of the world, so we know you can hear us. And apologise, there's a there's a poll running, and I haven't actually um, stopped it. Thanks for participating in that quick poll there. There's the uh, answers to your. Uh, to the to results of the poll, so fifty percent of the audience had uh, micron of less than twenty six percent, twenty six micron. Thirty uh, percent of the audience have micron or fibre diameter between twenty six and twenty eight micron, and fifteen percent of the audience had their micron or their fibre diameter between twenty eight and 30 micron. And then we have one lone participant who has their fibre diameter over 32 micron. So interesting poll there, and um, it's, uh, it's a bit finer than, we'd, than what we'd expected, but uh, it's good to see those results. So thank you for participating in that. Just excuse us for a second, ladies and gentlemen. We seem to be having a, a small problem um, making the screen show here. Okay, we're up and running. So. Andrew Woods, he's the principal of Independent Commodity Services, a small and niche wool marketing firm, uh, well, wool uh, market analysis firm based in Wagga Wagga that he runs with his wife, uh, Carmel Woods. Now, Andrew hails from out near Hay, and I'd, I'd uh, uh, suggest that he's one of the best people we can have looking at the wool market and providing us with information on on what the price drivers are, you know, right from crossbred wools tonight, right through to the super fine den. And then you have myself, who's a consultant with Home Sackett. Now with that, Andrew is going to be kicking off the start of tonight's webinar, and he's going to talk uh, to a few uh, uh, a few issues, uh, predominantly the drivers of crossbred wool price, and then he'll move on and talk a little bit to the opportunities in the wool shed to increase price received. After that, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about breeding for increased wool from and uh, prime lamb flocks and uh, predominantly the contribution of wool to prime lamb income. Oh, I missed the word there and, and some of the relationships between wool and meat related traits that we need to consider when we're embarking on setting up our breeding objectives for a prime lamb flock. So with that, I'd like to welcome Andrew to the webinar. Can you hear us there, Andrew? Yep. Yep, thanks. Good evening, everyone. No worries. Right. Well, Dave's just put this um, first slide together just to 
give some idea of indicative cost of having a uh, class or in a uh, and some uh, watersheds of various sizes, ranging from two to four stands, um, and working it back to a cost per uh, clean fleece, a kilo of clean fleece weight. And, so, and the, the the point of the slide is just to show that uh, it's the the cost of having a class in the shed is not uh, not a, a huge impost on a on a clip, and uh, they become um, Evident why we sort of put that up front um, uh, for tonight's discussion. So if we go to the next slide, Dave. So when Dave asked about uh, what opportunities there were in terms of increasing uh, income from um, across red clips, it's probably more it's, it's one of the opportunities not to. Um, uh, Miss out on income from a crossbred clip, even though the uh, wools are a, a small component of uh, uh, the crossbred enterprise. Um, if you've done all the work and you've got the wool ready for sale, um, it's uh, the, the uh, it's um, uh, best to uh, capture all the all the value you can from that wool. Now, one of the things that have been that has been happening in the in the crossbred clip over the last decade is the the proportion of Unskirted wool, which is deemed non-conforming by by AWEX and the and the uh, a, uh, typing system, is being growing steadily. So this little graph, this little schematic in front of you, shows you've got the various breeds along the bottom: superfine merino crossbred downs, and then carpet shedding runs with for merino and crossies. And you've got the uh, the, the bars. And if you look at the crossbred, which is the third one along, it's sort of 25 to 30 percent. And that's telling us that about nearly a third of the crossbred clip in the past year has been sold at, at auction uh, as non-conforming. So it's basically and unskirted. So by that I mean it's got a D certificate and it's it's had uh, some fribs uh, flagged in the AWEX ID. So that's saying that um, the wool has either been either been prepared in the shed without a classer. Or it's been prepared so poorly that uh, when it's got to the show floor, the um, uh, the, the system is deemed that it doesn't meet the uh, uh, AWEX code of practice. But in, in general, it just means a class that hasn't put their stencil on. So, and that's uh, that that's a, a frightening thing for the in, in, for the industry in terms of uh, uh, preparation standards. Um, if you look at Merino, it's only sort of two or three percent, but uh, um, uh, uh, that's sort of grown, but it's only a very much slower rate. So there's about uh, a third, nearly a third, nearly thirty percent of the crossbred clips um, uh, prepared without a class are willing to put their stance on, or a class have been um, present in the shed, and that proportion's growing. And if you talk to brokers, it, it's, it is a bit of an issue. For, for some clips. So Dave, you flip over to the next one. So what does the, uh, what's a, a clip, a crossbreed clip that's uh, a D certificate, got a D certificate that's non-conforming, doesn't uh, meet the uh, uh, AWEX code of practice with some fribs, which is what U1 says. What's it cost you? And it doesn't cost a whole lot. So this is a, this is a discount by Micron, running from 23 through 32 Micron. And uh, over the last year, and it varies between Micron, there's a bit of noise in there, but the, the, the median cost is only about 2%. So it's not a big cost. Now, the one rider with that is the, the clips that are used there don't have much, don't have any serious fault at all. They might have a bit of VM, but they don't have any color or cot or camper in them. So this is just for good straight clips. So that 2% for U1 D cert, so light frib. So next one, Dave. And then if you've got U2, which is heavier frib, uh, with a D certificate, uh, it's costing about nearly 4%. Now, so the cost is uh, not high um, because you've, you're rolling uh, pieces into that and you're getting uh, a slightly finer overall um, uh, fleece piece uh, micron, which can, put, particularly on the finer ends, can push you up a bit, up the uh, 
price curve. So that's good. So the, the, the trap is that um, not all crossbred clips are suitable for unskirted. And this is where the trap comes along. So the next few slides we're going to look at show just what the costs are if you if you let some fault through into the into uh, the sample on the show floor. So next one, please, Dave. So the first one is an H2 colour. So that's a sort of serious colour, whether it be yellow or un unscarable, heavy unscarable colour. And again, it uh, shows the uh, average price effect over the last uh, year, last 12 months, um, by micron, running from 25 through to 31 micron. Um, and and I just it's um, the the buy side of the industry doesn't like colour and crossbreeding, so they'll whack. 10%. Uh, the median is probably about seven, but uh, you can have e easily up to sort of 10% uh, uh, discount if uh, um, some heavy colour gets through in the sample. Next one, Dave. Cot. So um, the first one's looking at just a light cot. Um, the C1, the C1 discount is probably somewhere between. It varies, but the median is about five, about ten percent. But easy to lose five to ten percent with a C1 cot. Um, there's, a, there's, um, there's six levels of cot in the in the AOX system, which is probably a few too many. But the, this is the fourth one. This is uh, so this is very reasonable wool. It's hard to tear apart, so it's going to be harder harder to break up when the processor gets it. So five. About ten percent median. It's easy to lose five to ten percent on C1. Next one, Dave, which shows C2. There's less of it around, but they hate it. And if it comes in, you're getting sort of anywhere between twenty and a fifty percent discount on C2 cot. They detest it, and it's a bit like JL. JLs are sort of in a similar, a similar. Um, uh, a uh, similar area in terms of discount and for a similar reason that, that uh, they're hard to pull apart they just take that much more work as far as across uh, as far as the processor goes next one please Dave. so you get to the question so do we skirt or do we or or um, or do we uh, uh, prepare the clip unskirted and this is a classic uh, um, uh, advisor sitting on the fence and saying there's no straightforward answer and that it depends on the on the season and the time of the year so time of the year um, in the spring typically when there's not much vm around it's going to be far more favorable to preparing wood like that um, if you get a wet summer for example um, and there's a lot of color coming through then that might be an issue sort of come next autumn um, where you may you, you're probably going to have to prepare the clip traditionally um, uh, high VM periods, which typically are sort of from April through to August, uh, well certainly from the from the autumn onwards, uh, are not going to be favourable to unskirted clips. If uh, if uh, wool's coming through, it's got jowls on it, or it's just got heavy VM, you're really going to need to take it off. So the, the answer to that is it really sort of depends on the on the season you're having and the time of year and you need to talk to people about it. So the first port of call is going to be a wool broker and asking if you think it's all right and if, if the, that preparation um, is uh, su suitable for for that combination of uh, uh, of, of clip season and, and, and time of year. Uh, but that's that's uh, probably the that's one of the big messages as I've come keeps getting um, thrown back by brokers is that they can see why people are uh, saving costs in the shed by reducing uh, labour, uh, unskirted, uh, preparing unskirted clips in the shed can make a, a, an old shed that's a wall storm into a nice smoothly operating um, um, flow of, uh, of wool, it's, it works a treat. But you've got to make sure you've got the right right sort of wool to be able to do that. Next one, Dave. So 
The other thing that the uh, the industry isn't keen on is camp or medulated fibre, which is sort of typically you know, something like a downs, downs all that comes through the system. So <clears throat> to give you an idea, this little graph shows the sort of five-year median price from 20 microns through the 36 microns, so from the fine end of crossy clip through to the to the out the broad end of our clip. And if you think you've got the you've got the New Zealand clip goes out on out further at 38 and 39 microns. Um, so we've got the crossy in the in the top line, and and the lower line is the five-year median for a downs price. And it sort of gives it gives you an idea of the um, <coughs> Uh, the the potential uh, uh, discount if if you've got uh, some uh, lots coming through that they, that uh, have got down showing up in the uh, um, in the sample you sort of drop from one line down to the other and it becomes quite expensive. Um, next one, Dave. So uh, this is just shows you in percentage terms the difference between uh, downs and crossbed fleece. Um, and the reason I, I say that is that uh, there's probably about 20, 20 to 30 percent of uh, uh, crossbred lambs, well, 20, there's 20 to 30 percent of crossbred cardings in that sort of that fine end, which is sort of matches the, the people tonight uh, are on the line tonight. In that sort of 24, 25, 26 micron range, which is where most of the sort of crossbred, young crossbred bull falls in the Australian clip, about 20 or 30 percent has has uh, uh, camped in it, and that's sort of been consistent, nearly consistent. That's been reasonably consistent for the last decade, um, and that's a that's a real issue in terms of of trying to value wool because if you if you've ever tried to value uh, um, Crossbow wool on paper, you can have a whole range of lots that all look the same. And when the and you get the price results back at the, at the end of the week, and uh, they're all over the place. And if you talk to the braggers and say, "Oh, yeah, just a little bit of Kemp showed up in the, in that lot, so we got discounted," so it sort of comes back to this uh, preparation in in the shed. You've got to make sure if you if you can as to keep uh, if you've got Kemp coming through. On some of those lots, try and keep it out as, or keep it contained as much as you can, and keep otherwise you, your crossy wool gets uh, discounted quite heavily. Next one, Dave. So that's just sort of reiterating sort of the 20 or 30 percent of the crossbred carding lots have camping them. It's a bit more. That's that's for the. Uh, the finer end, if you go down the broader end, um, it rises and picks up from there. Um, it's not such a big issue in combing lots, but it's mainly in the shorter stuff. In the um, and it causes issues as far as um, <coughs> valuing. Um, it's, if you, again, you talk to the brokers, and, and, uh, exporters have sort of certainly become a lot more sensitive to the presence of. Uh, camp and medulla and fibre in uh, crossbred lots over the last decade or so. They're just they're a lot more careful in terms of their buying and making sure that uh, <coughs> um, if it's there, then they'll, they'll discount the cover themselves. Next one, Dave. Ah, Thanks, Woodsy. That's probably him. Yeah. Probably wraps up. Yeah, I think so. I mean, but the, I was going to say that there's two key messages that sort of come through and then have been sort of uh, hammered through to me over the last four or five years from the broker side. And that one is not all crossbred clips are suitable for uh, unskirted preparation. You can understand why people go to unskirted because it uh, makes life a lot easier and it can cut the cost out of the system. So that all makes good sense. You just got to make sure that the quality doesn't drop away too far, and so and outweigh the, your savings. Um, and you, even even when you're um, uh, preparing unskirted in that fashion, you really need someone in the shed keeping an eye on the quality control. Um, and that 
usually is going to be a, a classer because uh, it's in their interest. Even if the wool's been prepared on it, uh, it pays to have someone keeping an eye out, keeping the stain out, keeping the most colour got and the kemp out of the, out of the system and uh, keeping the wool in line. And that way you're, sort of trying, you're basically maximising the value of your clip. I think that just about does me, though. Thanks, Woodsy. That's perfect. Appreciate that. And um, everyone, Andrew will be about uh, towards the end of the webinar for a question and answer time. So, Andrew, if you want to give us uh, 10 minutes and I'll knock over my part and um, we'll hear you at the end again. Okay, no problems. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very, very interesting stuff from Andrew there. And so, the main thrust of my subject matter tonight is, okay, we've looked at what are the options uh, to improve wool revenue in the wool shed, at the you know, uh, clip preparation and um, uh, uh, or the management of the, of the wool through the shed. What I wanted to focus on more specifically is should we be including fleece trait ASVVs in our prime lamb selection indices now? This here will relate specific, uh, more more so for the self-replacing composite prime lamb flocks out there, um, as they are the ones that have control over the genetics of their of their first cross uh, of their of their replacement use, and um, those in a first cross operation, uh, those wool wool trade genetics will be heavily influenced by the replacement use they buy, um, and um, so that'll more marketing, I suppose, purchasing uh, uh, power in regards to buying the genetics they want for their wool, whereas in a self-replacing uh, composite system, uh, we've got to make uh, the best decisions by the genetic progress of the animal with a view of increasing revenue of the entire operation over the long term. So in case you need to duck off tonight, I've decided to put the key messages up front. Um, uh, so, should we be including fleece trade ASBVs in our prime lamb selection indices? So, these are the, I suggest no, and there's three key reasons for that. Uh, it's number one, lamb income differentiates the better producers from the rest. It's not actually wool income. Uh, wool contributes very little to prime lamb income. So, consequently, you need large movements in wool production traits. Um, to match small movements in meat traits over the long term. And lastly, wool traits are generally unfavourably correlated to meat traits. So this slows the rate of gain in meat traits if selection pressure is placed on the wool traits. Now, so they're the key messages that are falling out of tonight's, uh, uh, to my, my, my subject matter tonight. And if you want to stick around, then let's talk about... Um, uh, what I mean. So, firstly, I'd like to make a mention that this data has come from the Home Sackett uh, benchmarking data set. Now, a cursory disclaimer on that is it does represent a biased sample of the industry. Um, yeah, we benchmark between 50 and 100 prime lamb flocks each year and have been doing so. This is our 20th year. Um, but, you know, uh, as uh, in any uh, yeah, surveying um, operation whereby people elect um, and are not nominated randomly to participate, then it does collect a bias sample of the data. Nonetheless, it does have a, have a, a fairly large uh, sample size and uh, we are quite confident in the key messages flowing out from that data. So quickly, and it makes perfect sense, uh, the relative contribution of wool and prime lamb gross income. As we can see here, over the last three years at least, wool has only contributed around that 15% to prime lamb income, with the remainder uh, made up of what we call sheep income, which is uh, 95 to sometimes 100% lamb income. So depending on, on the operation, but uh, a large majority, uh, almost 100% of the sheep income is actually derived directly from lamb sales. That means 
meaning that they're sold before 12 months of age. Now, the top 20% are differentiated by land in income, not wool income. So this graph here shows us the marginal gross income generated by the top 20%, uh, ranked on profit per DSE, over the bottom 80%. On the left-hand axis there, we have marginal gross income, dollars per DSE, and this is cash income. Uh, this is not a gross profit, so it is, is directly the cash uh, derived per DSE from either the sheep income stream or the wool income stream. As we can see there, through 2015, 16, 17, uh, we've had about $12, um, up to $13 in 2016, and dropping back to $8 in 2017 of income derived uh, from the sheep trading operation and then only a very small part coming from the wool. So less than a dollar in all years. Oh, no, it's, it's, my apologies, I've interpreted the graph wrong. Uh, so this is the marginal increase in gross income by the top 20% over the 80, uh, the bottom 80%, So which means that the top 20% produced $12 more uh, cash income per DSE um, than, than the bottom. 80%, whereas when you look at the wool income, uh, they produce on par or sometimes even less wool income per DSE than the bottom 80%. So the key message is that the top 20% are differentiated by lamb income, not wool income. I threw this in uh, as a matter of interest uh, that borderless and marina ewes have a $3 uh, income advantage over other breeds um, per DSE. But the key question is, is does this matter? Um, can other breeds make up those $3 in meat related uh, or lamb income? And the answer to that is yes. And the outcome of our recent uh, MLA uh, Southern Sheep and, uh, Situation Analysis is that it doesn't matter uh, at the profitability level whether you run a first cross border Leicester merino you operation or a composite, self-replacing composite, you can perform equally well at a profit per DSE level. So further ramming home this message of, uh, of the wool income not driving the performance of or the relative profitability of prime lamb operations is this graph here which shows us uh, the prime lamb income for wool and sheep, uh, sheep and lamb combined, at the range of micron brackets. So we can see there that, yes, between 24 and 26 and 34 and 36, so a 10 micron difference is relating to about a $5 uh, discount of wool income per DSE. Now, uh, it looks a little bit more significant at the, at the whole, at the total income level. However, that's more relation, uh, more a result of um, prime of the actual lamb income dropping off uh, at those uh, at those higher uh, at those higher micron brackets for reasons unrelated to to wool income. Um, when you look at the practical level, if you're going to move two or three or four micron on a prime lamb flock, say if you're at 30 or 32, and you you move back to 28 or 30, it's uh, really only worth about a dollar to you. Um, Per, per DSE. And likewise, this graph here looks specifically at um, fleece cut as opposed to micron, and there's no clear increase in prime lamb income at the higher fleece weights. So we can see there that um, once we get to 2.53 micron, uh, 2.5 to 3 kilograms clean, uh, clean fleece weight, um, that there's no difference really in the amount of uh, wool income per DSE or even the total income per DSE. So moving on more specifically to deal with the, the genetics of selecting or increasing selection pressure on prime lamb flocks for wool related traits. Uh, the key thing that we need to understand is that wool and meat traits are generally uncomplementary, which means that 
if you select for one, sometimes it has a negative or unfavorable um, selection pressure on the other through its correlation with that other trade. So I pulled together a table here. Now that's a, a, uh, an overview of four different papers I've uh, looked at. Now, the caveat is that there's a lot more merino data relating to this topic than there is uh, specifically crossbred data because obviously crossbred uh, fleece, uh, the relationship between uh, growth uh, and body weight uh, and reproductive traits in crossbreds have not been studied against uh, wool traits very much, but I have got one paper in there that um, has pretty much confirmed that uh, most of the merino relationships are, are similar to those in the crossbred in the crossbred uh, breed as well. Now, to break it down simply, you, you, if you have if you select for clean fleece weight, um, what happens the body weight? The relationship is actually favourable. So this is the this is one uh, then where if you select for one, it doesn't have a deleterious effect on the other trait. So clean fleece weight has a positive or favourable relationship with uh, body weight. So if you select for higher clean fleece weights, you uh, by a matter of course you'll actually increase body weight as well. But that's where it stops. Um, the strength there is 0.1 to 0.2. Uh, the fibre diameter versus body weight has an unfavourable relationship, which means that as you select for decreasing fibre diameter, you also select uh, for decreasing body weight uh, and vice versa. So that's an unfavourable, even though it's a positive relationship, it's actually unfavourable and it's a similar strength to, to the clean fleece weight and body weight of 0.1 to 0.2. Now, if we drop down um, to the reproduction traits, uh, now fleece weight versus reproduction is an unfavourable relationship there. Um, now, I'm not a geneticist, and so uh, in the papers they said moderate to high, so I'll, I'll say moderate to high as well. So it's a moderately uh, uh, to highly unfavourable relationship between fleece weight and reproduction. So as fleece weight uh, goes up, reproduction comes down. And lastly, fibre diamond versus reproduction, unfavourable to favourable. So there was a bit of a mixed, uh, mixed bag of results here, depending on which paper you read, uh, low to moderate strength. So that means that if you select for decreasing fibre diameter, you can have uh, both positive effects on reproduction and negative effects or negative correlations to reproduction. Um, on the balance, it was a, a unfavourable relationship, but one or two papers basically suggested there was very little effect on reproduction uh, for selecting for decreasing in fibre diameter. So, don't hold me to this, but uh, I've basically pulled together a very um, uh, crude pictorial here to try and um, emphasise that genetic progress in meat traits slows as we increase emphasis on other traits, uh, especially if they're unfavourably correlated. So on, your, on the left hand side there, you'll see my crude genetically untested scale of rate of genetic progress. Um, obviously, as you push down into the red, your rate of genetic progress slows. So if you increase uh, the emphasis on selection for fleece weight, um, if you increase, uh, if you push uh, a pot, you know, push fleece weight up, your, your growth rate of your animal will slow, even though we saw there was a favourable relationship, because that relationship's not 100% correlation, i.e., um, uh, you know, they don't go up in unison, that while ever you start to shift the emphasis from growth rate itself onto fleece weight, um, you'll slow the rate of growth rate or genetic progress in growth rate or, or body weight of, of the animals. Uh, but with a negative or unfavourable relationship, you'll slow the rate of genetic progress and reproduction a lot more if you select for increasing fleece weight. On the other side there with fibre diameter, if you increase selection pressure on fibre diameter, so you try and drive fibre diameter down to, to push yourself maybe from the, the, 20, the 29 micron where you saw in Andrew Woods' graph um, and, and, and you started to make steeper gains or or more rapid gains and increase in price received to your fleece as you push down towards 23, 24 micron, um, you will have a, uh, you'll slow your genetic progress in growth rate considerably because there's a, a uh, unfavorable relationship between fibre diameter and growth rate. And you'll also slow the rate of progress uh, and genetic progress in reproduction, um, even though that the relationship or the correlations are 
could be slightly unfavorable or slightly favorable. Um, but by taking your eye off reproduction itself, uh, you'll, you'll in turn slow the rate of genetic progress in that space. Now, so we've talked uh, specifically to the, uh, the rate of progress and the implications or the implications of including other traits and especially ones that are uh, negative or unfavorably related to um, uh, you know, uh, lamb or meat related traits into the selection indices and how it slows genetic progress. I wanted to pull this here together for you quickly so that we can see why we don't want to slow the rate of genetic progress in meat related traits. So, it's easy to generate additional wool in, uh, income by manipulating lamb production rather than wool production. So in short, a 1% gain in lamb equivalates to a 5% gain in wool income because of the different levels of contribution to gross income. Now, in other words, large improvements in wool quality and quantity traits are required to small, match small improvements in lamb production. So this table here, uh, pulled this together and basically on the Top line there, we have the parameter, we have sale weight, lamb sold per U, uh, or sale weight of the lamb, lamb sold per U, wool, kilograms of clean fleece weight, and fibre diet and micron. So the base case, if we say we sell a 20 kilo carcass, 120% lambing, 3.1 uh, uh, kilograms of clean fleece weight, and a use of 29 micron wool, which is about the average of the home sack benchmarking database over the last three years. Now, what I've done is to achieve a $5 marginal income um, increase over a uh, or over a, an undefined period um, if you were to move uh, you'll have to move your sale weight of your animal up by 0 0.7 of kilogram so 700 grams of, of carcass weight and that'll generate you you know your five dollars worth of value per you and the change absolute change in that parameter is three percent um, lamb sold per you. If you can shift over a period of genetic, of genetic gain, if you can shift lamb sold up by 4.2%, um, that will achieve you the same, a $5 value per you, and that will equate to three, uh, you know, again, a 3% change in parameter. But if we move over now to the fleece related traits, if we start off with a 3.1 kilo clean fleece weight and we increase that by 0 0.8 kilograms, uh, that relates to a $5 increase. In, in value per you, but that's actually 25% gain in in the actual uh, fleece weight of the of the of the base case you. So you'd have to make huge, uh, a lot bigger genetic uh, or rapid genetic gains in wool um, to uh, to match the 3% gains in the in the meat related traits. And fibre dome a very similar story. So we'd have to drop off about eight micron to to create a five dollar of benefit per U of income, and that would be a 28% drop or a negative, a negative movement of 28% of, of fibre diameter. So they're, so they're very big movements in the fleece related traits that required. So the key, the key message from that is that we don't want to be um, uh, sacrificing uh, a couple of percent gain in, in a meat related traits for a couple of percent gain in wool related traits. You need to make five times the gain in wool related traits to, to equivalent to the same amount of value per, per you as you would in the meat related traits. Now that's, that's the webinar for tonight. I apologize we went slightly out of time, but it was a, a little bit more to get through than usual. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to start putting some questions into the uh, questions box there. Um, Andrew's kindly stayed online for us to uh, ask him some questions about the crossbred wool market. And if you want me to um, elaborate more on the uh, on my work with the genetic aspect of selecting uh, selecting for increased wool revenue and prime land plots, I'm more than happy to talk to that. While we're waiting for uh, while we're waiting for that, we'll just confirming that next Wednesday night we have our last webinar for the year. Uh, that's going to be run by John Webb Ware. He's an excellent presenter, a real uh, depth of knowledge and experience, and he's going to be 
talking to us on the uh, about drugs that are, are reproductive drugs to increase fertility and reproduction in, in prime lamb flocks. So here we're dealing with issues such as melatonin injections and use and, and similar and similar um, uh, manage, management options that we have available to us as that. Now don't forget that before you sign off tonight you can uh, participate in the uh, webinar survey. We do appreciate everyone who, who takes two, two minutes just to drop their thoughts down in that survey. It does, um, uh, we do take notice and we can tell you know, what messages are being well received, what presenters are doing a good job, and that information is fed back to MLA to help them guide their strategic decision making in the extension materials. Finally, we will be recommencing next year. We haven't decided on a date yet, but it won't be straight away in January. It'll probably be late January and we'll be able to um, let you know in good time on what subjects we have in, in order and what presenters we have. So if anyone has particular topics they want tackled, um, use the post webinar survey to, to drop them in there. And even though we do have a schedule already, uh, we'll take notice of what people uh, are looking to find more about. And if we can, we'll address those issues uh, with, uh, with a webinar. Okay, so Andrew, are you still with us? Yep. Yeah, thank you for your, Hi. thanks for your presentation tonight, Andrew. Um, I had a, a question there um, relating to your presentation, if I might take the liberty to, to ask. <laughs> yeah, far away. <laughs> um, with regards to with regards to uh, first cross fleeces versus um, the composite fleeces, would you say there's any specific um, preparation fleece preparation options we have in the shed uh, that we should be looking at um, to you know to make sure we get the the best price received in the marketplace? Um, considering that one might be more down or more, might have more downs related wool or and the other one probably a, a, a lower micron and probably a better quality wool. Yeah, well, I suppose if you look at the, that, that price, uh, the five year median prices for the crossbred fleece and the downs fleece, it sort of shows you once you get beyond the 30 micron, the, the two series come pretty close together. So. I think the, in practical terms, it means once you get sort of beyond 30 micron, um, which is where you're going to get a lot of the composites coming in, um, it's, um, it's probably not a lot of, it's, there's not a lot you can do in terms of uh, uh, making a, making the clip a lot prettier. First, the first first cross, which is you coming in and uh, you've got various micron grade, so you've got sort of about 29 micron. Once you get underneath that, uh, um, uh, it sort of starts to pay just to um, make sure you've, you, it's as simple as meeting the code of practice, um, really, uh, um, and making sure you do everything right. So you just maxim, maximise your, your income. Um, so that, it's, it's pretty. It's pretty. It's a very plain message. And there's nothing sort of no special insight in that, but it's worth repeating. It's just that you need to you know, do, meet the industry standards. So the composites on the on the broader side of 30 micron, oh, yeah, well, you're never going to do much with those. That's just the reality of it. That's, you know, they just sort of fall, they sort of, they fall into what's the true cross bed what the rest of the world calls cross bed. We call it sort of broad to carpet, but really uh, um, it's, it's what the rest of the world calls crossbreeding. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a huge range in price for the different sort of categories in that area, so I'm not sure it's worth spending a whole lot of time trying to make it too pretty. Yeah, no worries. Does that help, Dave? And uh, I had another question that I wanted to ask. Um, with regards to direct marketing, is there any any options available to crossbred fleeces, uh, crossbred clips, 
to increase price received or, or drop the cost of selling uh, through direct marketing? Uh, direct marketing, you mean as in just uh, selling direct to a to a merchant of some sort? Yeah, yeah. Well, anything that would take out those um, commission costs. Uh, well, <laughs> classic advisor again. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you get people. Um, Price, uh, sometimes wool in the bush is ex quite expensive and, and it's good to sell, but you need to know what you're selling. That's the, you need to be reason, reasonably confident what you're selling. So <clears throat> for composites, that might be such an issue because there's not a big price variation, but if you're coming, if you're under 29 micro and you're sneaking into the finer, finer category, which is what a lot of the attendees tonight are in, that be, you, you just, you need to know what you're selling. So uh, odds on the, um, um, the the merchant that's buying will have a fair idea. And if you want to sort of go head to head with them, um, good luck. But uh, um, so sometimes yes, but you need to have done some court, some sample, um, uh, some core tests and, and um, guidance tests and had them have those results so you know what you're selling. Um, that's that's the trap, and, and that's why auctions have costs, but they also they're highly transparent. You know exactly what you well, I shouldn't say that. You know pretty well what you're selling, and, and uh, uh, the, you, know, you certainly do in terms of fiber diameter, length, and strength, and VM and yield and things like that. So, um, so sometimes Dave, but you've got to not not always, and, and then uh, then you'll. Uh, this always seems to happen before a market starts to move up. Then you get you get helpful people from China and Italy ringing out, China and India ringing up and saying they want to buy direct from farmers. And uh, it's usually because they've got full, some full, full warning that prices are rising. But you, you then, uh, uh, dealing with those sort of people, you've got counterparty risk, which you know the grains industry has plenty of, but the wool industry doesn't. Um, so the counterparty risk is that uh, you may not get paid. So you just have to choose your counterparties um, wisely as well. Okay, that's some good points there. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, now, if anybody's got some uh, more questions for Andrew there, please jump on and, and uh, put them in the questions box. But um, quick question here from Grant. Uh, what Micron? What uh, about those who don't have crossbreds but are learning more? So, uh, so I'm not 100 percent sure how to answer that, Grant. But uh, if you if you uh, want to expand, then I'll be more than happy to um, to address that. Uh, what micron? So I suppose on face value we're dealing with um, that sort of 24 to 34 micron bracket here this evening. But um, I think most of those genetic related um, uh, or relationships between uh, body weight and, and, and fleece characteristics are, are fairly uh, robust across uh, most uh, microns. So uh, um, even though that uh, 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 there is some variation even between in between um, you know the merinos and the crossbreds. Um, now there's been a question here from Tim. Uh, what's happening in the current maternal indices with regards to uh, fleece characteristics. So that's a great question, Tim. So there are, oh, from what I know of, the three key maternal indices, uh, the BLX, the MCP. Uh, so BLX is the border less to cross, and that's um, for obviously your first cross, uh, first cross producers uh, who are producing first cross lambs for their prime lamb operation. And then you have the MC plus, or MCP, the uh, um, meat, uh, I can't actually remember the acronym, sorry, the MCP plus. Um, so the BLX and the MCP plus indices do actually have uh, a selection pressure on there for clean fleece weight. And now, and the MCP indice doesn't. Uh, so the two that do have s uh, some 
slight selection pressure for uh, clean fleece weight. That's been put in there um, in response to concerns by the, the general industry that they're losing wool off the animals and they want to uh, try and maintain the wool on the animals. Now, if you actually have a close look at the, the relative economic value of including the wool uh, selection pressure into those indices, it's, it's very small. It contributes to about 2% of the economic value of genetic gain over a 10 year time frame which is very small, whereas the meat related traits obviously relate to uh, all the other values, so the 90% plus. The interesting thing now is that those, the selection pressure is quite, uh, quite small in those indices and is there not to increase fleece weight, uh, but more just to maintain it. So the, um, what you'll see is that there's actually a, a negligible increase in fleece weight over a 10 year period, but it's not being lost while they're still gaining the meat related traits that they need. Uh, alternatively, the MCP uh, indice that intuitively uh, you'd have a, a greater loss of fleece weight over that period as they increase the selection pressure on the prime, on the actual meat traits. So, Andrew, with that, I think um, that wraps up most of our questions for this evening. Okay, no problems. Awesome, thank you for uh, coming on board and, and um, providing some of your data for tonight's webinar and um, we look forward to, to, um, to being able to present some of your data at future sessions uh, where and if we see fit. By all means, it be a pleasure. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to the audience tonight for participating in the webinar. Don't forget that post-webinar survey. And if you want to leave any comments and and um, option alternatives for future webinars, then please jot them in there. Any critical feedback, please put it in there. We, we consider it all and the positive as well. So thank you very much uh, on behalf of uh, MLA. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next week uh, to listen to John Webb Ware present on reproductive drugs to increase uh, fertility and uh, in, in, in prime lamb flocks. Have a good evening.